chant, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. One day, the heavenly beings came to be to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited him incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz and They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. This is the word of the Lord. So for those who are with us on Zoom today, I want to invite you to get a piece of paper or a pencil or something where you can jot something down. For those in the sanctuary, I'm going to give you a piece of paper and a pen if you don't already have one. And actually, I'll hand to Nora and ask her to send them back for you. Because we're going to have an opportunity during our sermon today for you all to do a little reflection, to jot a note to yourself, to draw a picture for yourself, whatever works for you as the time comes. But before we can dive too deep into today's scripture, we really need to understand what it is we're reading. Job is a book of the Bible that often gets quoted or looked to to make a point for somebody. I've heard it quoted, I've heard it used to explain things, but Job's not really intended to explain things as much as make us think about things. So before we can dive too deep into it, we need to think about what it is we're reading. So portions of Job are presented as poetry. They are dialogue, really monologues, presented in a poetic fashion, in verse. It's like a musical. Other portions of the book are presented as narrative. It's story. But none of it's in a historical context. None of it. None of it's placed in the chronology even of the story of God's people. So this whole story that we get of Abraham and Abraham's descendants and how that flows into Egypt and then the coming out of Egypt and Moses and the journey in the wilderness and then the settlement in the new land and then the kingdom and David, that whole story, Job doesn't fit in it. It's not in the context of the story and it's not in any context of history. It's a one for. 
It's a separate piece. At its core, it is culturally Jewish. It reflects theology, and for most of the book, it's pre-exile theology, before they're conquered by Syria and Babylon and taken into exile. It reflects the belief systems and structures and customs pre-exile, although some get added on later in the book. It reflects the symbolism and the practices of the Jewish tradition. But if it's not history, and if it's not part of the story, what is it? It's probably best understood as a scenario, as a scenario. It's an ethical dilemma that you give to a group of people to wrestle with. It's a problem, it's a question of suffering that's handed to someone to theologically debate together, to discuss together. It's a scenario for learning, for growing, for wrestling with. Job, as a scenario, also doesn't have a particular outcome we're supposed to get to. It does, it's not like a parable where it says, and at the end, these are some things you might draw from it. It's not like an object lesson where you say, I'm going to take this pen and teach them about love. It's not that. It's not a this for that. It's an open-ended scenario that we are intended to reflect on, to pray on, to wrestle with, to discuss, to debate, to argue over, to chew on, to come back to again at different stages in our life and see where we're at with it. It's a book to teach us how we think, to teach us to question, to help us understand ethics and theology and how they connect to our lives. Now it starts with that opening narrative section the heavenly beings talking about our world as they've been exploring it. And one of the characters is named Satan, or the Satan, Ha-Satan in Hebrew. Ha-Satan means adversary. It's actually a very common word. David is described as Ha-Satan to King Saul. So it's not like it's saved for the really evil people with the pitchforks and the horns. Ha-Satan is like devil's advocate, if you will. Someone who sets the other side of the story and invites us to think about things we may have just assumed before. And Ha-Satan is hard at work in this story, challenging the goodness that God sees in people. God says, look at all my people, aren't they wonderful? And Ha-Satan says, uh-huh, it's called privilege, God. Take it away and see how they act. It's basically, at its core, the same plot to Trading Places. If you've seen Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd in the old late 80s, early 90s movie, if you take away all the good stuff, will they still be good? And if you give someone who's had all the bad stuff good stuff, will they get good? Hasatan is challenging the premise that people are just good on their own. And chapter two brings us to the second round of this conversation. Job has already lost his children, wealth, and all the livestock in this cosmic bet back in chapter one, and remained faithful. Now, Hasatan suggests that physical suffering is what will break Job. And so the scenario continues. Job is left physically and emotionally crippled, sitting on an ash heap, the trash pile, if you will, the compost burn pile for the family, covered in sores, scratching himself with a piece of pottery, trying to make the itching of the sores go away. Mourning, lamenting, and scratching, and then his friends show up. And they say nothing. They participate in the cultural traditions of the day. Torn garments, ashes, and dust on their heads. They sit with Job in silence, just being present with their hurting friend. Rituals and presence. That's the story we come into today. In the midst of someone suffering, rituals and presence of others are lifted up as a response. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to invite you to think and reflect, because that's what Job's here for, not just for me to pontificate on. You can write your answers, you can draw your answers, you can just think your answers into the universe if you want. Some of us would identify that as prayer. But however you want to go through these moments, I'm going to give you some questions, some reflection prompts, 
And then I'm going to leave some silence, and that's okay, all right? In another time, or any time in your life, think of a time when you have felt emotionally and physically done, spent, exhausted. Think of a time when you have felt emotionally and physically done. What emotions did you feel? What emotions did you feel? You can draw an emoji, you can write a word, however it works for you. Or you can just tap into that feeling now. How did you feel about yourself? How did you feel about others? How did you feel about God in that moment? In this or another time when you felt done, what did you long for? What did you long for? Did you hope for what was healthy or long for healing? I wonder who you wanted by your side. I wonder who came into your life during this time. In this or another time when you felt done, how did you imagine your future? How did you imagine your future? I wonder about your sense of power or agency. I wonder what assumptions you made about how the world truly works. In this or another time when you felt done, where did change come from? Where did change come from? I wonder what you lost that may never come back. I wonder what you found that can never be taken away. I wonder who you remember as companions during this time.
I wonder how this changed the way you relate to people. In this or another time when you felt done, how did the world change? How did the world change? I wonder what assumptions you had challenged. I wonder what wisdom you drew from the experience. You are welcome to keep working on these reflections and zone me out. It is a sermon, so you all are perfectly trained at how to do that. Or you're welcome to journey with me as we look a little further into the response of the friends and what comes after this moment. This moment in chapter two where the friends come and participate in the rituals and traditions provide their presence, give comfort to Job, and to where it goes sideways. In chapter three, our scenario gets expanded because Job speaks. He speaks from a place of hurt. He lashes out against himself. If you wondered how he's dealt with this situation, it's not good. He wishes he'd never been born Job speaks for himself, but he doesn't ask anyone else what they think. He shares his grief and pain, but it's not intended as a conversation starter. And then in chapter four, our scenario gets complicated because Job's friends start talking. Heaven forbid, one person talk and the extroverts in the room not find their way into the process, right? Between the friends, we get to hear an ongoing conversation between Job and God. So a friend speaks, and then Job will speak, and God will speak, and Job will speak, and God will speak, and then we get another friend. And each cycle of this really is another lens on the whole question of suffering. Each friend offers another really bad cliche response. Well, what did you do to cause this? Well, what did your family do to cause this? Well, maybe you didn't cause it, but you were arrogant enough, and that's another thing in itself. Maybe it's something else you did that's not an actual sin, but because you were so haughty about not sinning, it happened. Each one offers a different lens to suffering, each one equally as cringeworthy. They basically say, well, God doesn't give you more than you can handle, and another one says, God has a plan, and one says, yes, but you're still hashtag blessed. Each chapter, we get a different cycle on suffering. Job's a long book, but it's still not intended for them to respond to. <laughs> Job is a book that is not even intended for us to read and understand. It's intended to draw us into reflection like we did today, to invite us into conversation like I hope will happen after church today. I hope that you and friends will wrestle with the reflections you've done today, that you in your own journal might go back and have a conversation with yourself, that family might talk about how we talk about some of these things or how we don't. Job also reminds us there is no simple answering to the suffering around us. Some people just need our presence. 
even our silent accompaniment on the journey. I still remember the first time the woman who would be my wife took my hand, said nothing, just held it and walked with me when I was a hot mess. We were 18 years old, no idea we would ever end up dating and be a thing, but I knew what her presence meant to me already. Sometimes we just need a silent accompanist. That's not good advice for piano recitals, by the way, or practicums. Silent accompaniment doesn't work. Just, you can't not play and say your minister said that was a sacred thing, sorry. Some of us need to participate, to physically engage in something, to have something tactile. Rituals, rites of passage, customs that bring us comfort. I remember after 9-11, the following Sunday, the senior minister I served with said, forget the bulletin, here's the order of worship. He gave me four scriptures, four songs, and said he was closing it in prayer. They were four songs most of the church could have sung without looking at a hymnal. They were four scriptures that half the church was reciting along with them. They'd known it so long. And I said, why? This is time for a prophetic moment, a voice. We need to be confronting the injustices that we've been ignoring that have led people to think violence and planes into buildings will make a difference. We need to be talking about this. And he said, not today, we don't. Today is about what's comfortable, what's known. We're too scared to hear anything else. We read Psalm 23. He sang Amazing Grace. We ignored how bad the theology was in Amazing Grace. But we were comforted. Even in our church family, we have cranes and stones on the altar that we can come up and place as a visible, tactile symbol of what we can't get words for or what's too private to share at the moment. As a symbol of hope or of healing, we light candles. We have rituals and traditions we participate in that bring comfort and hope. And sometimes when we're suffering, we need to engage in those things, the deep wisdom embedded in symbols and ritual. Some people, when they're hurting, though, just need to be heard. Not debated, not challenged, but heard to be understood, to be seen. We may disagree with everything they're saying. What they're saying may be horribly problematic, but in the moment they need to be seen and heard and affirmed that they have agency again, that what they say makes a difference that will draw the ears of someone who cares. We can have the deeper conversation about what's good, what's healthy, what's bad, what's wrong later. The first thing we need when we're deep in our suffering, we need presence, we need comfort, and we need agency to be known and seen and understood. It's good when our world is not falling apart to think about what we need when it does, to think about what helps us personally when we're struggling and to tell those around us. Say, hey, when I'm really in a pit, this helps me. It's good when our world is not falling apart to think about God's role in our life, to think about how we can lean into that relationship and remind ourselves. It's good when our world is not falling apart to wrestle with what suffering means to us, to reflect on what our words mean when we offer them to those who are suffering, so that we might be present with those in need, so that we might be present with those who are hurting or confused or struggling, so that we might be present without causing pain, so that we might be present in our presence in our presence, others will feel God with them. It is good when our world is not falling apart to pray our way through difficult questions so that when our time comes, when our diagnosis is given, when our symptoms become active, when what we thought we knew crumbles, there are memories to draw on. There are rituals in which to find comfort. There are relationships to cherish, journals to reread, prayers to repeat. When what we thought we knew is crushed, when we are sitting on a trash heap of our life, 
The pieces we scratch ourselves with will be familiar. They will be a piece of something we know. The piece we grab at in range as we seek blame might also be a bomb in our hand. The pieces we run our fingers through might actually form a picture as we pull them together. That from the pieces of our life, we might see an image of truth still reflected back, both back up at us. A picture of the world as we knew it to be. A picture of love, and grace, perseverance, and hope. A picture that might slowly, maybe painfully, draw us back or lead us forward. If you have not seen Encanto yet, let me know and I will give you my Disney Plus password for the day. Much of the drama is around a shattered piece of vision for the future. Uncle Bruno, who can see the future, and he has disappeared because people didn't like him predicting their future, has left shards of glass, and in it is an image of young Maribel and a question of whether or not the future is good or bad and her role in it. It's pieces of the world as it might be. And as she collects them, as she wrestles with what they may be, they draw her forward and in the end bring healing. You see her at the center of a whole family. But one piece on its own, sometimes is just enough to scratch the wound. Job as a story is not here to make us feel good. It's not here to scare us about the devil either. Let's be clear about that. And it's not really here to teach us a lesson. Job's here to help us engage in the complexity of our world and the complexity of the space between our minds and our hearts. Job invites us into this space as individuals and into that space collectively. And if it happens that in your time of reflection, if it happens to you that you feel like you've gotten a hold of a piece, that you've understood something else, that you've learned, that you've grown, that you've gained insight, then you now have a chapter to contribute to this open-ended book of our sacred text. You now have your chapter to add. Whatever you have scribbled on your page, whatever you have drawn, whatever you have reflected on in your own mind today, that is your chapter to add on to the story of Job, to the conversation of Job. You are ready to add your chapter to our never-ending story. Amen. Mm -hmm.